Welcome to the Best Hour of Their Day podcast with your hosts, Jason Fernandez. And me, Jason Ackerman. With more than 20 years in the business, as both coaches and affiliate owners, our passion is to help create world-class affiliates and coaches by building better boxes. boxes. Welcome to the best hour of your day. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Best hour of their day. If you get sued, call Matt at general. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. A, don't get sued. A, don't get sued. Uh, but we got Matt, uh, I think maybe it was like your third or fourth time on the show. I think third, maybe four. Maybe four. I feel like it's September. third, but maybe four. Repeat. But also, repeat. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, from Jim Lawyers. Uh, so if you're, if you're curious, just jimlawyers.com. And, uh, and we refer out to Matt quite a bit uh, because members send me their leases and they're like, can you look over this? I'm like, I can look over this. I, however, cannot give you any feedback on it because I am not an attorney. So, um, so yeah, he's been, uh, I mean, it's fair to say that like, well, actually, I don't, I don't even know. Do you do any other legal work outside of the gym world? Um, not anymore, unless I'm specifically asked by a gym owner to do so. Got it. Um, like. I, I will. Uh, yeah. I don't litigate at all. I will never go to court again. I hate it. It's miserable. Um, you know, but I think if I was an attorney, I would only litigate because I like to fight. I'd be like, let's go. Yeah, to I court. tried that. Ready. It was miserable. It was um, miserable. But um, uh, yeah, we've done podcast. We've done previous podcasts on, you know, buying a gym. Like, how do you how do you draft and how do you, you know, strategize a, a purchase or sale uh, and mm-hmm. different aspects of that? What are some mm-hmm. things to uh, kind of CYA yourself in that process. So go back and take a and take a listen to those episodes. Um, but today we're going to dive a little bit into uh, membership agreements, contracts. We call them to some degree. We call them transparency sheets, things of that nature, uh, and some other things like that. Because we do get questions about that, and there there is, I don't know, is it fair to say like there's a decent amount? I mean, it's not it's not like the most nuanced topic of all time, but there's there's a decent amount of nuance to how I draft an, uh, an agreement to both make it legally appropriate but also to mm-hmm. make it binding in some sense if i was going to try to win a charge back yes yeah yeah there there's there's some nuance there's a lot of expectation we should be setting in our membership agreements and and we'll kind of bounce them back and forth between words contract and agreement um i just want to kind of put that caveat out there uh Can that... we, is it well let me ask you a clarifying question yeah. is it appropriate to use those interchangeably from my perspective yes okay um Now I've had gym owners, you know, they'll push back and say, well, we don't do contracts. And I'll say, so you don't have anything at all in writing with your members. And they go, oh, no, no, no. We have like a, we have an agreement, but it's just like a month to month thing. From my perspective, anytime I offer to give you services and you offer to give me money, that's a contract. Right. Um, So we're going to use them interchangeably. I don't mean just because we're entering into a contract that I'm locking you in for three months, six months, 12 months, et cetera. Right. Right. Okay. So uh, there's two components of this. We can address them separately. One, we'll talk with the first one with the, just the basic contract agreement. So insert whatever length of agreement that you Mm -hmm. at your gym want to, um, want to have that before and then the other version of that is is some sort of paid in full variation so okay. let's okay. let's start with the hey i want to do uh you know a year long or a six month agreement slash contract of some sort what are some of the things that i need to have in place and and forget the um uh what are the stipulations of that agreement just like what are what are the more like the legal components of that that i need to think about before we get into like hey this is what the penalty is and this is how i execute all of that yeah. And so you're talking about, you said a six month or 12 month contract. Are you talking, but you're not talking paid in full. You're talking still like monthly installments. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So for instance, yeah. So let uh, me tee this up a little bit better. I did a poor job there. The Let's just say that you have, because a lot of what will help people design is an incentive based pricing suite, meaning, hey, if you're here longer, it is this price point. So let's, I'll make up numbers. If you want, if you want to be here for the year, it's uh, it's 180. Uh, whatever that billing cycle is, one month or four mm-hmm. weeks. Mm-hmm. And if you mm-hmm. want to do half the year, then it's 190. And if you want no agreement length, whatever, it's 205. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the general sort of understanding that's going to flow through this entire conversation is the more we set expectations with our members, the less likely we are to have problems with them in the long run. 
Can you say that again, please? Sure. <laughs> the louder for the people in the back. The more you set expectations, even with your partners in your gym, <laughs> the best problems you're going to have in the long run. Um, yeah, let that be a life lesson, you know, with your spouse, with your friends. Anyway, um, that's that shouldn't be overlooked. And this is this is one of the things that we teach people is like, if you do this well on the front end, the problems that you will mitigate or eliminate on the back end is not insignificant. It's never going to be zero. Right. But it, it will drastically decrease the, the crap that you have to deal with on the back. End. Oh, yeah. 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 And and you you jokingly started this episode by saying, like, if you get sued, call me. It's it's too late. I don't litigate anymore. Uh, <laughs> call me before that so right. I can help you set expectations with your members so you don't get sued. Uh, all right. So, you know, we're, we're talking right now. We're talking about messing with people's money. Right. And, and, and whether it's like a $50 all access because you do like a 24 seven access gym and where it's a $200, um, you know, I think I, I, here in California, like an unlimited membership at one of the CrossFit gyms locally is like 215 or $225. And that's, a, that's a significant chunk of change for me. Okay. If I'm paying that on a monthly basis. So I want to know what's happening to my money. Um, and so those are sort of the, the starting points in any membership agreement is you have to tell people what you're going to do with their money. Um, and, and that would be, you know, what, what is, okay, we're doing a monthly installment payment plan, but right. you're locking me in, quote unquote, uh, for six months. Okay, well, let's start there. I need to understand in writing that I'm committing to six months and what uh, the, my monthly charge is going to be for each month of that six months and how often are you taking payment? Are you taking payment on the first of the month? Are you taking payment on the anniversary date of signing the agreement? Is it every four weeks? You know, how often should I be seeing $225 coming out of my account? Um, and so that's like, that's like base, like what, what am I buying and, and how much are you going to hit my money? And then from there, you know, we need to start setting other expectations like, okay, I signed this, but, is there an out? Like, can I get out? And, and what is, what are the, you know, if, if I'm four months into my six month and I don't want to come anymore, are you the gym owner going to try to hold me to those two final payments? Mm -hmm. uh, can I get out of this? And if so, how do I get out of it? Uh, and so we, these are questions that we start walking gym owners down. And sometimes we get them to, they're just like, I don't, I don't know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. What would you suggest in that realm? But well, that, that's the, so this is all obviously, or uh, not obviously, but this also shouldn't be overlooked is you don't have to know. You just have to start working through that process. Sure. Like, oh yeah, sure. You know, sure. at the end of the day, there's only so many options. Yeah. Like we could, we, we could very easily outline the, that, the, the big ticket items there, but you just start working through that. And it's a very, it's a, it's a, at least a decently simple, if this, then that type of exercise. Well, if they cancel, then what do we do? How do we want to rectify this situation and, and make it so that it's fair for both parties. And then the beauty of what you're outlining here is when you're when you set the expectation, you you're setting the rules. Yeah. For how this interaction goes and be like, hey, if they right. cancel, this is the rules. Right. Right. Are you giving them a refund? Are you letting them out early? Do they have to pay a penalty? You know, all all of it. And, and another way that I'll I'll talk with gym owners about this is I will say if you're going to provide a written agreement like this. The agreement should try to answer the most common questions that you're going to get regarding the agreement. So I should be able to read your agreement and understand exactly what to expect. So you, you, you know, if your agreement says I have to pay $180 a month for the next six months, but I can cancel on a 30 day notice. My next question is going to be, well, will I have to pay anything to cancel? Right. Are you still going to make me try to pay the rest of it? And so these are questions that, you know, more experienced gym owners, they're going to have more interactions with their members and more interactions. They're going to come upon these problems. Right. Um, and, and then you just modify your membership agreement uh, if you see a consistent problem coming up. But, you know, if you're a brand new gym owner, this is where working with somebody like best hour of their day, where reaching out to somebody like me um, is beneficial because we know the common problems that you're going to run into with members and we know how to pump this stuff into an agreement so we can try to head off some of that stuff. I, I don't, one of the mistakes, at least I, I view this as a mistake is anytime we start talking about legal documents, people think that mm -hmm. it's very long drawn out and it's gotta, it's gotta be 
it's got to be something where like in order for me to decipher this another attorney would have to come in and look at this <laughs> which is just like no man right. it just right. needs to be clear and they need right. to be like, i understand i sign the dotted line right that's it yeah. so we really encourage people i'm like if you can't I, I look at it as like a one sheet if you cannot put this on a one sheet it's too damn long and and it's confusing yeah. at which point we can make some assumptions about what is going to happen when this situation for sure comes up down the road mm -hmm. where they're like i didn't understand this this is confusing you're trying to screw me over and it's just like no like nobody should say that i i look at it this way when i write that agreement if if i'm having that conversation on the back end that person's just a turd because there's no way that yeah. they could have misunderstood the agreement like it's right. impossible right. right you just don't like it now which is a different discussion. <laughs> it's a different discussion. And I and I am yeah. I understand why you might not like it now. But the point is, is like we agreed upon it. It was anything but unclear when mm -hmm. we set out. Mm -hmm. And you acknowledged it four times in four different areas, right? Like it's like, no, it's not unclear. And what you and what you want to tee up. This is I was I was talking about this yesterday. I don't think the point of the agreement is to get people right be like ha gotcha like you can't do this, right I, really i look at it the other way it's it's to not get got right that's why yeah. i have it in yeah. place right i'm not trying to get screwed over when i when i write this because i always reserve the right to break the rules yeah so um so just a quick quick note on what you just said and then i'll address on what you really further what you said was another thing to keep in mind when you're writing these is do not put something in writing that you're not prepared to enforce. Right. You can make exceptions. I will say never, but every right. gym owner does it. I'm a gym owner. I'm an attorney. I make exceptions on my membership agreements every so often because we can't cover every situation. But right. if you're going to put in your membership agreement that you require a 30 day written notice and there's some penalty that you're not prepared not to enforce, <laughs> don't put it in there that you require a 30 day notice. Um, now, beyond that, you're right. These things don't need to be incredibly complicated. The reason that lawyers get bad reps for drafting giant contracts is because through experience, we try to cover every possible scenario and all of a sudden you end up with a 30 page membership agreement. It's not necessary. Right. Um, typically, our, our typical membership agreement outline is going to start with all the necessary terms on like the first page or two and then further explanations of everything further down. Um, so, you know, you say something like, well, we, we require a 30 day notice of cancellation. Well, okay, that's easy for them to understand, but now like what form does that notice need to come in? What happens if we don't? All that stuff's explained further down. Right. So basic terms up are all up front and then We'll get yeah, it. it's kind of like your, your frequency, um, you know, all of that. Like, yeah. what is the actual membership name? And then after that, it's like, hey, this is what happens when this happens. This is what happens when this yeah. happens. I, I think ours is four, four, uh, not even paragraphs, right? There are four bullet points that are not even full paragraphs. But mm -hmm. every, every time somebody reads it, they're like, yep, that makes sense. That's fair. And I'm like, perfect. Yeah. That's the response that I want when somebody <laughs> reads that, you know. Um, but it's important because. I think people are resistant to contracts because they're like, I just don't, I don't want, I feel it's gross to me. And I'm like, well, don't write gross contracts then, man. Yeah, like right. write a contract <laughs> that's fair. Like what's, what's the best version of this that you want to, that you want to, that you want to dial up. I'm like, write that. Like you can write yeah. whatever version of this that you want. Right. Um, and I think people, when they're like, oh, okay. And I'm like, right. Because there is a component and i've said this time and time again there is a component of retention to a contract it is not mm -hmm. going to lock them in forever it does not it is not how you keep people it is one of maybe 35 variables inside yeah. of a retention component and it's it's it is a thing so just for everybody out there like know that it, it is a thing and it has it has a component of that and you always reserve the right to break the rules. It's so cover cover the big ticket items is my recommendation. Cover the things that you know are going to come up. And if you don't know, yeah. I guarantee you call somebody, call us, like we know what they are. There's like, yeah, right. I don't know, five scenarios tops. Yeah. Right. Outside of that, they're like, what happens if this happens? I'm like, in the one in a million chance, that <laughs> make the right decision and do the right thing. That's the answer. You know? Yeah, um, I agree. Now. With the legal language stuff, you and I talked a little bit before we got on here about state requirements. 
there is very little we can do about that kind of thick, uh, hard to, to digest long. Some, some states have longer provisions than others. And, you know, if you don't want to go down into these weeds just yet, we can, we can hold off, but, um, no, I we think do have to segue. I mean, we covered the most things like, so now yeah. we're talking a little bit for the most part where this comes into play, where I, at least where I see it more frequently than, um, is paid in fulls. So there's some sort of stipulation on a paid in full where it, it, it is, it is either not allowed by yeah. the state or you're required to carry a bond of some sort, or those yes. are the two kind of big components there. And then a lot of questions are like, is it worth the bond? And I'm like, well, it depends on how you utilize the strategy. Yeah. 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 Let me kind of give a little bit of a background on that. Um, because I think this is still a topic that most gym owners are not very aware of, maybe not be very comfortable understanding. So, you know, I, I will say everybody, all the gym, every gym understands that they need a liability waiver, right? Okay. And they understand that like, if somebody comes in and they break their bet, they, they break something in my gym, I better have a waiver in order to protect me against that personal injury. But then when we start talking membership agreements, they're like, no, 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 like you're, no, no, I don't want anything in writing. I don't want to lock them in, whatever. Well, we don't always get that choice, right? Uh, because almost every state has some variation of what's called a health club act. Could be a health spa act, right? The 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 prepaid entertainment law, the health studios act, or whatever it is. It's it's all the same version of the same thing, which basically says, if you're a gym, you likely have to register with the state. Now they're going to define in there, like, what does a health club mean or what is a health club? But I can guarantee you that everyone, a CrossFit gym falls within the definition of a health club, right? We start to get into nuances when we're talking like cheerleading, sometimes dance, sometimes martial arts, but guaranteed CrossFit gym falls under every definition of what a health club or health spa is. All right. So step one is we then have to look at what kind of state requirement there is for registration. Um, a lot of, uh, if they have this, they're going to require the gym, regardless of the type of contract or membership or anything that you're selling to register with the attorney general's office with the state to say you're a business and you're selling these. All right. Step two is once you register, you have to have your membership agreement in writing. Um, and that's where, you know, you can kind of push back on these gym owners that say, well, I don't want anything in writing because I don't want to lock anybody in. Well, your state kind of requires you to do it. You, so you, you have, have, to, have to have something, something in writing. Right. Um, and oftentimes, if once we have something in writing, we also have to put in additional statutory language. So literally copy and paste from the Health Club Act, that statute, into the membership agreement, um, language that usually concerns something involving cancellation. So... There's things called buyer's remorse clauses and what happens if the member dies while they're a member. And, and this language has to be in your contract. Um, and then you kind of go into that third element, which is now that we're registered and now that we have our memberships, do we then have to post what's called a surety bond with the state? Uh, now, a surety bond is merely just a monetary bond that the state holds on to usually like you said if you're selling something like three months six month year long paid in fulls but not every state's like that um texas for example i just happen to know texas pretty well if you're selling something that is longer than 31 days then you have to register with the state and, and go through the the surrogate bond process i know florida um, also requires one yeah florida i mean almost every state it's just the length Right. Uh, you know, Pennsylvania says that if you're not selling anything over three months, then you don't have to worry about it. So I can sell a, a three month paid in full and I don't have to worry about uh, the registering or, or uh, the surety bond or anything. But, you know, the surety bond is this usually it usually starts like twenty five thousand dollars that the state then holds on to in the event that the gym owner just turns around and closes their doors and all the members go, wait a second, I paid for a year in advance. I want my money back. They can then go claim against that bond. Just for the record, the bond does not cost twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, is. I was just gonna get there because every time I say that, people are like, "Holy oh, shit, to go up with twenty five thousand? No, you don't. There are bondsmen out there. We use one very specifically um, that you can you pay usually like one to five percent a year of the bond, uh, depending on your credit history, and they'll post the bond for you. If you've ever been arrested, you know about bonds, but it's a <laughs> principle. Um, 
So, yeah. So, and I think it's just knowing that. So then the question that we will get is like, is the bond worth it? Like, do I not mm -hmm. utilize this because mm -hmm. I have to pay a bond on it? And my stance is it's probably still worth it. There's a couple things that I would definitely want to see you have in place. One is, is you need to have a budget. Like you need to be yeah, budgeting for that bond, right? Meaning like I have to pay that, whatever that one to 5% is, it could be as high as, you know, call it 1500 bucks and yeah. maybe, maybe to pay for that. And I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to take the paid in full off the table because it can be a very, very effective strategy if utilized mm -hmm. correctly, at which point, like, you're not going to, you're not going to care about the $1,500. I'm not going to say you're going to, I'm not going to say you're going to love stroking the check, but it's going to be worth it. It'll be worth it to you if you execute that strategy properly in order to get large sums of capital inside of the business so that you can operate more freely there. Um, so mm -hmm. I do think it is worth it with a couple of stipulations, meaning like you're executing the strategy properly and you're budgeting to pay the bond, just like you budget to pay your affiliate fee or your insurance. Sure. Right? Like all yep. like my insurance is yep. coming up this month, I believe. Yeah. Cause they just sent me a questionnaire on, I'm like, I'm, I'm ready to pay that thing in full because we've got mm -hmm. support. And if for bonds, it's the same thing. You should be ready to pay it in full because you set aside whatever that is. Side note on budget. Yeah. Everybody that has a lease is probably realizing this right now. Landlords are hammering people on cam overages right now. Cam v. Yes. Yep. Me, dude, I got a 50% cam. Oh. He's like, hey, it was 50% of one month's rent, essentially, is what it was. It was the overage. Yeah. And he they got me last year and then they got me this year. And I was just like, cool. but it got bigger both years. Before they'd get me, it was a little bit. And then the last two years, it's been sizable. Right. Where yeah. It was just like three to five thousand dollars. And I was like, nope, yeah. you're not getting me next year. I like literally put a line <laughs> item in my budget and I was just like cam overages because the landlord's a turd. Um, so, yeah, we're getting those calls about once a week, not to get off on that side tangent, but uh, it is. Well, we're getting them once a week of okay. like, so I can't let's, afford let's, my rent now. OK, let's. <laughs> so. What recourse, if any, does or what should a gym owner be doing? When you get that, because I was a little grumpy about it. Number one, for a couple of yeah. reasons. One, it was two weeks notice. Two, it's smack dab in the middle of tax season. And I'm like, dude, I've been here, I don't know, 12 years. Like, can you give me a little heads up on this? And yep. dude, with my landlord, I've been here so long. I'm like, I'm not paying you all that next month. I'm going to, I'm going to split it up because like, I yeah, yeah, want yeah. to, right. But why? Because yeah. I don't, I don't want to. That's why I can. Yeah. I just don't want to. So wait, we want to go down that path just real I, fast. I do, yeah. personally. <laughs> yeah. my podcast, so that's, we're going to do a detour. You're, 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 you're kind of, you're, you're past the ball on this one uh, because you've already signed the lease and you're already into it and you're already having to pay it. Uh, now, you know, let's start from the very beginning. The very beginning is we can make suggestions at the time of reviewing the lease before you sign it that will help ease the blow okay uh, a couple of things that we might suggest is is we will set in the lease when by what date the landlord has to let you know each year whether or not you've over or underpaid for your cams during the previous year um so you know a lot of leases will just say at some point during the year the landlord's going to let you know about this well okay great but like you just said it can come at really inopportune times um, so let's put something in there that says something like by February 15th or by March 1, uh, if we know that my insurance and my affiliate fee both come out in the months of February and March, maybe we want to work with the landlord to try to get notice of that in January. Okay. So we can control that. And then the also, second thing, why, why, why are you never like, I, why is there never a cam? Why are you never, why did you never pay over? Like, why is that never a scenario? I don't know. That's like, that's like your mortgage. You know, my, my, I never pay. My mortgage taxes are always under. <laughs> so, like, how, why, why does this only go one direction? I don't, I don't. Like yeah, it. it never goes. I've talked to very few gym owners, but it does happen that they get some kind of a refund or credit. Oh, your rent's year, lost next month. I'm like, what? Barely ever. Barely ever. Um, you know, the other thing we can do is, is try to work with the landlord to get more time to allow the gym owner to pay the, the shortages on the cams. So like yours, it, it might say something like 10 days or 15 days. Well, no, 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 no. I want to get one full billing cycle on my gym before I have to pay this. So I'm automatically going to ask that landlord for 30 days or 45 days mm -hmm. at least in order to pay this. Um, so that way I get one full billing cycle for all of my members. So I have a little bit of extra cash to pay right. it. Um, so, so that's sort of like 
number one, um, we try to catch it up front to give the gym owners easier time to, to handle these things. Hey guys, if you're an affiliate owner and you're struggling with your time, one of the things that we help affiliate owners with is prioritizing what they should be working on and when. That's one of the key focuses inside of Affiliate University. So if that's something you struggle with, hit us up, set up a call. We'd love to chat with you, but we want you guys to run better boxes. So we'll see you on the inside. With that, so we get questions about four week billing all the time. Like, why? Right? This is mm -hmm. a this is a perfect example. Number one, there are multiple months inside of the year that have more than four weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So which means I have to pay for additional overhead in those months. I'm gonna have to pay for overages in other places like CAM fees, right? And mm -hmm doing four week billing cycle allows you to globally account for those additional spent expenses that are not realized in one month. This is this is one of the key components of why that is beneficial. It obviously brings in more revenue. In some instances, you're going to keep all that revenue. But in, a, in most instances, all I'm doing is accounting for all of these other expenses that are variable. These are not fixed expenses. I don't know right. what they're going to be year over year. My, my yep. labor cost will, it could fluctuate, you know, drastically in, in a, in a month with an extra week, but my revenue is not going to go up, you know, 20%, but my labor cost can go up 20% in a month that has five weeks. Like that's a, yep. that's a real thing. So this is one of the strategies to offset that expense. And most people don't know that they're essentially just paying the additional 8% in expenses every single year. And if you move to four week billing cycle, this is a way to get that back in order to create better revenue streams in order to capture those expenses appropriately yeah. inside of that. And cam, and cam overages is one of them. You know, if you're yeah. looking at a, you know, for us, I'm like, I don't know what the, it's, that's a, what was that? That was a, it's five grand. Dude, it was like eight mm, to 10%, eight wow. to 10%. It was more than five grand. Yeah. It, was eight, it was like, it was probably more than 10. It was just under. Was, was the, was the lump sum that they wanted you to pay to, to make up the difference? Yeah. They were like, Hey, your rent in this month is like, what I think it was like, it was almost $16,000. I was like, yeah. I was Holy like, shit. yeah. I was like, I'll sorry. Pay. I just, I, so I just put a, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's put an explicit on this. <laughs> yeah. I don't care. But, but that's the kind of shit that, that everybody gets caught with their pants down and then they don't, yeah. they don't really know what to do. And, and because you know, they give you all of that information way after the fact. So it's hard. You can't reasonably plan for it until you get burned enough times. You're like, okay, I know it's going to be about this much. I will just start putting money in a pot over here that next month, next year, when it comes up, I'm still gonna be pissed off about it, but I'll, I'll be able yeah. to just pay it up front because I was planning for it appropriately. Right. So, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, in a situation like you, where you, you're, you're already in the lease, it's already signed oftentimes and, and for whatever gym owners are, are afraid to sometimes like reach out to the landlords and i get it that like some landlords are pieces of crap and they're and they're these big giant companies and and you know like you own a gym in pennsylvania and the 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 landlord the actual property owner is in california and you're dealing with a property manager that that won't talk to you so i get it i get that like reaching out isn't always that easy but bottom line is opening a door of communication can oftentimes help with this stuff. Um, and you know, that's at any time a, a gym owner has an issue with the, with paying their rent. The first thing I'll tell them to do is go tell your landlord, because even though it's in the lease, if the landlord's okay, you know, they'll work with you on some of this stuff because the last thing a landlord wants to do is have to evict somebody, turn over property and find somebody else to rent it. It's going to cost them um, so much money. They're going to lose so rent. much time and money to make pay commissions on the new tenant, you know, yeah. all of that stuff. So they definitely don't want that. And if you go, but go to them with a plan, meaning like, Hey, here's what I'm going to do. Like, this is the notice we got. We were not prepared for that sum or whatever it was. Um, so here's, here's what I can do. Yeah. Here's what I can do. And I think that specific phrase is very important. Here's what I can do. If you just say, yep. here's what I want to do. That's totally different because yeah, right. the landlord right. doesn't right. care what you want to do. Say, here's what I can do. Because again, they do not want to kick you out. It's going to cost them so much time and effort and ass pain. They're just not interested. And yeah. they will, they yeah. will in more, in some instances, some of the bigger, um, you know, uh, real estate companies are easier to deal with because it's like such a, minuscule monetary oh, yeah. figure yeah. to them. They're like, whatever, that's fine. Just make sure you pay us and we'll be good. Yeah. Just make sure you get a million dollar, you know, 
um, entities. But some of the smaller ones, I think, are harder to deal with because they're not running you know, $50 million a year in revenue. Mm -hmm. Like they have mm -hmm. three properties that cash flow a half a million and they're trying to manage all of that. So I agree with you. I tell yeah, people, and oh, sometimes like, go talk to the landlord. They're like, what should I do? And I'm like, you should pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. Or, you know, sometimes getting somebody like us or a local attorney to make that initial conversation and you've got the little ESQ behind your name right. can also help grease some wheels every right. now and again. Right. Um, but, you know, as a last resort, we do have gym owners that come and say, it's gone up now. I cannot afford this. I need out of my lease. Um, and once again, that's oftentimes just, it, it's just an open, a, an opening of communication. This is sort of like the last ditch option is to then open up with that landlord and say, we can't afford it. Yeah. Like you're going to put us out of business. And again, landlords don't want to do this because they know you know, we, we, again, we don't go down the personal guarantee route, but they know that it's going to be very difficult for them to get money if you go out of business and just drop up, drop out of the property. Um, I've had big companies go ahead and adjust cams uh, in order to help gym owners survive. I've had them do buyout agreements for far less than what they owe on the on the lease. Right. Um, or you know, you just say, look, you know, put the, put the place on the market. Give me forty five days notice we're going out of business. You can like, we'll just keep paying until you find somebody and then we'll, we'll get out of our lease. So there's all kinds of options, but yeah. uh, you know, I just want to throw out some of those for, for, you know, some for feeling the pain, like you're feeling right now with those cams that you haven't budgeted for that you need to budget for. And well that, and uh, we are seeing, you know, the um, rents are going up in some places where they're, they're legitimately forcing gyms out. It's not a ton, but it is happening. Oh yeah. No, you're right. Um, you're right. And you know, the other thing to think about too, when you're signing those leases is like, it's a 3% increase every year. Yeah. But 3% is not 3% every year. It's 3% of the previous number, which is not 3% anymore. That like right. that becomes exponential. And I don't think people realize how that math works. Yeah. Depending on what it is. Like they're like, it's 3% increase. I'm like, well, if I look at what I'm paying versus three years ago, it's a 20% increase <laughs> compared to, you know, you started the lease at 2000, right? We're five years into this. We're now paying 2,800, 3% of 2,800 is a lot more than 3%. It's a lot more than 3%, 000. right? And I, and, right. and it's like, again, the eighth wonder of the world compounding, right? It's just like, if you don't understand how that works, like you have to budget that in year over year, mm -hmm. because like your rent is not going to go up a little bit. Like you need to factor that in. So anyway, yeah. Um, all right, back on track. Let's go back. Which to... also, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll segue us back as a great reason to put in your membership agreement that you reserve the right to raise your rates on a yearly basis with notice to your clients. Not that you uh, will, that you reserve, nope, but you the, reserve the right to. Right. right. Because again, that math doesn't check out either, right? They're like, you, we're going to raise it 3% every year. I'm like, you're going to price yourself out of the market in 36 months. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, do the math yeah. on that. I'm like, you went from whatever it was, that's a, it's going to end up being, you know, in some instances, it'll end up being a $25 increase over what you're right. currently at. And these are the same gyms that are like, you know, f freaking out about increasing $5. I'm like, yeah, what are you talking about, dude? Like you, you're, you're going to, that's going to be a, a tough go of that. Yeah. Like you're yeah. going to start pushing people out of your gym. Yeah, but put it in your membership agreement. So there, we segued back to membership agreements. What were we talking about? You're just a pro, a pro, a pro, just a pro. <laughs> uh, I can segue this legal stuff all day long. All day long, um, all day long. Now, now let me, let, I, I will bring this up for, uh, on the membership agreement because I started the, our membership agreement this going down this path, a story like state requirements saying, you know, gym owners understand the negative consequences of not having a, a waiver but they don't always understand the negative consequences of not having a, a, a membership agreement. Now I'm not talking about like having to give refunds or, or chargebacks, not being able to fight chargebacks. We can talk about that stuff. What I'm talking about is if you, if your state says you're, you're a health club by definition and, and you have to register and you have to have a written membership agreement and, or you have to post a bond, you know, maybe, and you decide, no, nope, I'm just not going to do this stuff because I'm not jumping through those hoops. If somebody gets hurt in your gym, and you don't have a waiver. It's shutting your gym down. Okay? Oh, you're that. Yeah, you're screwed. If you don't, if your state requires you to have a membership agreement and, and to, to post with the state or to register with the state and post the bond and you don't and you get caught, you're shutting your gym down uh, because you're now looking at injunctive relief, which means the state can come in and prevent you from operating until they figure out what else they're going to do with you, 
We're looking at monetary damages, um, especially from clients that are now cons oftentimes considered what are violations of the Consumer Protection Act, which means three times the damages that you do owe. You know, if I if I take thousand dollars off of a member and the member gets mad and sues me because I didn't have a, a proper membership agreement, I'm now looking at the potential of three thousand dollars back to that member. Uh, and finally, a lot of states put in criminal penalties uh, that they can charge the gym owners with, you know, misdemeanor criminal penalties for operating an unregistered business in the state. So, you know, again, I try to liken this to sort of get to get people to understand the seriousness of it. If you don't have a waiver and somebody gets hurt in your gym, you're done. If you don't have a, a some kind of a written membership agreement that is compliant with your state laws and your state says you have to do this and register and potentially post a bond and you don't and you get caught, you're going to be done. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you can't take this stuff lightly. You can't just say, well, I'll never get caught. I only have 150 members. I'm such a small gym. Um, because especially, you know, also depending on which state you're in, they will track you down. Uh, oh, you, yeah. you're, oh, they're you're in business long enough. They're coming for you. They're going to find you. Yeah, they're coming yeah. for you. That's not that's that's guaranteed. Um, OK, I want to chat a little bit about the. What are some things that a gym owner needs to be needs to consider if you're going to have a, a, an additional person, whether it be somebody who's running personal training services or a massage therapist mm. or uh, whatever uh, un, in under the overarching umbrella? of your business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. liability mm -hmm. <laughs> liability <laughs> let's talk about it <laughs> liability all right transitioning over here okay so uh we're going to take this we have our employees we have our independent contractors we're paying these people to go and perform a service on behalf of the gym the gym brings in the money from the client we pay the staff to go service that client Right. That's that's sort of a different conversation. I think you and I touched on that, like in our first episode yeah. very uh, a while ago. You're now talking about a different situation and that I've got like 500 square feet in my gym. That's just sort of like dead space. I don't really use it. Um, so a physical therapist wants to come in and sublease. And I'm going to use those terms. If you can't see us, I'm using my air quotes here, sublease that space off of you or We've got the the new and upcoming trainer who wants to try to get a, a personal training practice going, but they can't afford the overhead. Well, they're going to come in and pay you essentially to use your equipment. Right. Um, something like this. Okay. Now, this is not a technical sublease uh, in the sense that like we now have to refer back to your to your lease to your turn lease, to, yeah. to figure out what kind of notice we have to put the landlord on. Okay. It, this is just somebody's coming in and they're saying, you've got the available stuff. I'm going to pay you $300, $500 a month, 30% of my gross revenue, whatever you negotiate. Right. All right. So here's a couple of the issues that we run into. One is we need an agreement with that new business as to what expectations are being set forth. What's the space that they get access to? How much is it going to be? When do they have to pay you? Okay. Uh, do they have to keep the space clean? Can they use your equipment? Can they store some of their stuff in your gym? Yes, no. Can they solicit business from your clients? Okay. We have to think like there's another business running in my business. So we really need to be setting expectations about what that other business can do. I was talking to a gym owner the other day about this where she's got a basement level to her gym. And she's got two other businesses operating both in this basement and one's like a spin. The other one is, is like does do uses youth programs or something like that. Hmm. And they're button heads. <laughs> and so the other two tenants, you mean the other two tenants are now butting heads and butting heads with the gym owner uh, because there, there's no parameters. We're now working on those parameters, but there were no parameters set as to, you know, the, the spin studio is coming over and borrowing stuff from the from the the, the guy who's training kids and, and he's borrowing stuff from the gym owner and the gym owners come into the class going, where's where are my where are my my deadlift bars um, and, and having to go look for him. And, and like a three cause a Mexican standoff from a legal yeah. standoff. You have three people suing <laughs> each other really underneath the same umbrella. Oh. Okay, so first thing we got to do is we got to put this stuff down in writing so everybody knows what they're supposed to do and not supposed to do. And again, same thing with the membership agreements. If you don't know the questions to ask, 
that's why we're here. That's why you're here. Yes. Um, because we have, we know the questions that need to be asked in order to facilitate these conversations. Um, but now, all right. So next issue is this person is now coming in and they have a physical therapy um, practice, whatever. Well, they need insurance. Uh, they're not on our insurance. They're not on my insurance because they're not under my wing. They're paying me. Okay. You're not under your landlord's insurance. You have to maintain your own insurance. So, so does that other business. Uh, and you, the gym owner needs to be named insured on that business, uh, on the, right. on, in that insurance. Okay. They need to have their own liability waivers. You need to have somebody look at those liability waivers because if there's some like one page or insufficient liability waiver, that's not really good for you if somebody comes in and gets hurt in that service. Okay. Um, so these are, these are some of the things that we need to consider that other business needs to make sure they're, they're as legitimate as you are. Um, and sort of like the third and final area of that is what, what liability are you as the gym owner opening up yourself to? by having other people coming through your facility that are not your owner or not your members. Um, so it, this, this sort of this third prong really depends on where that other person is going to be setting up. Where's that other business setting up? If they're setting up in like the front office and the front lobby, that's like right inside your front door, we're probably okay. Okay. But if they're a personal trainer, and they're in the very back of your gym in the back corner or down in the basement or up in the loft or something like that. And they have to pass a, a good portion of your gym. Well, what happens if they get hurt? What happens if they go and use your bathroom and slip and fall? Um, you know, this is all, this is stuff called premises liability. Uh, so like so for what, example, I have, um, I have a massage therapist. Her office is located in our front lobby. Mm -hmm. And, but you would never leave our lobby to go to the bathroom, to go to her office at all in order to use her services. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's probably not a lot of premises liability there. Right. Um, so in your initial agreement, your sort of rental agreement with her, you would just have what's called an indemnific indemnification and hold harmless agreement where she's basically saying, if something comes out of this and you have getting sued, I'll take, you know, I'll, I'll make sure it goes through my insurance and claim it on there. Um, but you know, if let's, let's change it up and let's just say you are, your the, her, her setup was in like the back of your gym and now she, the, the, yeah, she has to go through her multiple client. spaces. It's on the other side. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, what happens if a barbell goes flying and hits them or, or they trip over a, a kettlebell or something in the pathway. So now we have to add another added layer of protection for the gym owner that says, uh, you know, we, you have, you own a gym, they're walking through your gym, there's premises liability there, they're walking through your inherently dangerous environment, they need to be waiving any issues that come up. So now that gym needs what's called a premises liability waiver. And to say to the massage therapist or the personal trainer or the physical therapist or whatever, so uh, you have your own business, you need your own insurance, you need to have your own waiver for your own service and you need to have all of your clients sign my premises waiver saying they can't sue me because they come through they're an invitee into my business and there's a potential that they're going to get hurt in those instances um would a would an additional certificate of insurance from that uh would they need to be so like i have to do this for most most gyms have to do this i don't know why you wouldn't if I'm going to do mm -hmm. like a competition, mm -hmm. you know, and let's just say, cause there's lots of these floating around. I think, uh, Festivus games and fun, you know, Granite games and, uh, fitness. Yeah. Games, I'm drawing where a you have to, on them. Where you have Girls to, on RX. Yeah. Like a bunch of them, but you have to carry, you have to provide an additional certificate of insurance that covers them, that, that overarching mm -hmm. entity, even if you're doing it in, in underneath your own roof, mm -hmm. so you can have your waivers and all that kind of stuff, but they will make you provide an additional certificate of insurance, which cost you, I don't know, 300 bucks on the low end, 1500 on the high end, yeah. depending on what, yeah, the, and you can usually cancel them. Is. Like, you know, um, yeah. Is that, is that something that you would also need in some of these instances? Like if somebody had a, I'm, a chiropractor, yeah, I'm gonna, there, did they, would they need to carry a certificate of, uh, an additional certificate of, uh, of insurance covering you as well? Sure. 
Um, I'm going to punt that to your insurance company. That's what but I, I think it's a say. phone call right. you need to make. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a phone call you need to make. Usually, my assumption would be probably not because the liability of somebody walking by your gym is far less than the liability of hosting a competition right. in your gym. Right. Um, but you do still want to get that waiver in there that that says you know, they're acknowledging there's some danger in walking through. And then you just want to double check with your insurance company because the worst thing that could ever happen is this happens and you call your insurance company and they say, yeah, you're not covered on that. You should have had an additional certificate of liability and you never let us know. Right. Right. Okay. That's what I thought you were going to say. I just wasn't sure. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, and I mean, here's the, here's the overarching theme here, which is when it comes to these matters, you know, a lot of people ask us these questions all the time and I'm like, yeah. This is a this is a legal or insurance matter. You need to go to the legal and insurance experts and 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 then provide them the scenario, because the fact that you're asking me means that you cl you clearly don't know, and yeah, I can't come up with every single scenario. Nor do I know the stipulations in whatever state you're in or whatever insurance provider is your is carrying your policy. Like you need to ask them these questions, and they're typically very easy answers. They answer these questions mm -hmm. all day long. Just get mm -hmm. on the phone or shoot them an email. You know, whether it's RRG or Affiliate Guard or whoever you use in the CrossFit space, like they'll get you an answer like real quick. Be like, yeah, here's what you need to do. And then you work through that paperwork, you know, call Matt and just give him the scenario. He'll be like, hey, this is, you know, probably what you're going to end up having to do. And here's what that would look like. So, you know, I, one, one thing I think, you know, you learn, you can learn this the hard way or you can just take our advice for it, which is, you know, you're going to encounter some of these scenarios one way or the other. So you might as well just have the conversations with the people that are going to be. So imagine be like, hey, what's worst case scenario here? Who am I going to have to be having conversations with? My insurance provider and probably an attorney. Yeah. Go to them now and say, hey, what do I need to know about this? What do I not know? What are the things yeah. I need to consider? And can we bake all of that in? And what does that look like? You'd be much better off doing that from day one than having to backpedal and correct mistakes. Because I can tell you having done the latter of those two that it's painful it's real painful. i really dislike those conversations it's too. Painful, dude and it's fucking expensive dude. like you know um so have those conversations early and then you can make sure that you're good to go and you'll sleep better at night to be honest with you yeah and and look at it from your perspective as the gym owner too like you you are specializing in crossfit essentially right. you know most most likely if you're listening to this podcast right. you're specializing in crossfit Somebody who wants to specialize in CrossFit is going to come see you and, and you're promoting yourself as that that niche individual uh, who has special knowledge and, and you, you're going to abide that and look at best hour of their day. You guys are, are specializing in the success of CrossFit businesses. That's your lane. And you have accountants and that's their lane. And so all of these professional services exist because that's our lane and, and we have the answers and you don't always have to, you know, I, I try to say it every time I get on the phone, every time I get on a podcast like this is you will not incur a fee just by reaching out to me. You won't even incur a fee just by talking to me. Hey, and listen, um, even if you did, right? Like, and here's the, here's the thing, right? It's kind of like, it's kind of like insurance. Be like, I don't want to pay somebody $300 or $400. You're not going to pay that an hour, number one, for most yeah, of these things. Right. But right. just, let's just say that you did. That is so much cheaper and what the the repercussions of not having this correct is going to be. Okay. That's true. I, listen, even if you do have those things in place and you have to go through that, it's going to be super expensive. And yeah, you win. it's always very it's expensive. It's going to be expensive, you know? Yeah. So it's just like, I would tell people, I'm like, listen, if you're going to go to the experts, if you have a legal question, don't ask your buddy, don't ask another gym <laughs> owner, go to a lawyer and ask them preferably somebody who specializes in the thing, which is what Matt does and, or go to an insurance provider, ask them the direct question. Um, cause I, a lot of people get a lot of bad information off of just somebody hurt Facebook. something and then they told somebody and they're like, Oh, this is fine. I'm like, that's so far from fine. I can't even <laughs> explain to you. you know? Yeah. My, 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 my fiance did that the other day. She showed me some video on Instagram of this woman talking about, uh, estate and, and you know state property and, and things passing through and she's like is this right and I'm like well no. maybe <laughs> maybe it, it's there, probably right so in, in one specific scenario at which point <laughs> everybody watching this doesn't have that specific scenario right right right, right. It, it's dude anytime when it comes to 
leases, coaches agreements, which we'll have you back on and talk about that on a, on a different podcast. But like, those are all the answer is like, it depends. It depends on the exact scenario, right? What are the, le- what's the, what's your legal entity type? What state are you in? What is the classification of yeah. this person that you are doing this contract with? Like there's a ton of variables here. And then you have to work through that process. Like, I don't know what else to yeah. tell you, but the repercussions of not doing that are, you know, potentially going out of business. So if you yeah. have legal questions, if you have insurance questions, go to the experts. They will help you out. Uh, and there's plenty of them in the space, right? So uh, those resources are available. Um, you know, Matt's can help us put together a bunch of stuff for our clients and looking forward to that. But um, if you guys have legal questions, we we send people to Matt all the time, the gymlawyers.com, you know, for all sorts of stuff. Anytime somebody, come, anytime something comes across my desk, I don't even respond. I just copy Matt on the reply. And I'm like, hey, Matt, check this out because I am not an attorney and have no desire to be an attorney. So, yeah. Um, where else uh, can people find you if they want to learn more? A um, lot of information on our blog on the website, gemlawyers.com. We're on Instagram. I think it's gem underscore lawyers underscore PLLC. Uh, but I'm sure if you just, just search gem lawyers. That is correct. I remember we talked about this. It would just pop up. Yeah. Um, I tried YouTube, but I'm not good at, at keeping up my YouTube videos. So that's probably, there's there's a lot of video there, but they're, I don't know, if you like watching them. Um, yeah, you can otherwise, listen. say, well, oh yeah, you could listen. You can listen to them. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I, it never hurts um, to be at least moderately educated on the legal components of running a business. Uh, you're better yeah, off, better but off the, than not. So the newsletter also, we we do a weekly newsletter. Um, that that's where a lot of a lot of our content gets consumed because it's you know it just goes out the on the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The website all the way at the bottom is a sign up for our newsletter. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, sign up for the newsletter. Week. Be a smarter gym owner. Uh, don't don't get sued. <laughs> Um, don't get sued. Uh, as always, man, I appreciate it, and we will have you back on to talk about oh, more, uh, more of the fun uh, components of yeah uh, of law. anytime. So uh, love it. All right, man. Thanks again. We'll have you back soon. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Best Hour of Their Day podcast. We appreciate you listening and choosing to have us help you in your passion for coaching and affiliate ownership. You can find more episodes just like this on all podcast platforms. If you're interested in learning more, you can reach out to us on any social media platforms, or you can visit www.besthouroftheirday.com to book a call. If you found this episode helpful for you, please share it so that we can help other coaches and affiliate owners to help build a bigger and stronger CrossFit community. Thanks for listening.